In this lecture today, we're going to be talking about mining geology. And we may not talk too much about um, precious metals and things like that. We did talk about minerals, but all of the things that we acquire for our electronics and goods, all of that come from somewhere. So it's important that we talk about how some of those um, metals that we use, where they come from and what mining is as a resource. So in this lecture, we're going to be talking about what an ore deposit is, where ores come from and how metals can be extracted from ores, uh, where non-metallic resources occur and how they're used, and some of the challenges that we face as a society with sustainability of energy sources in the future, not just about um, the metals in our phones, but some of the other things that we think about when we talk about mining. So what's a mineral resource? Well, it's a resource, uh, mineral resources can be separated into two categories. We have metallic and non-metallic. So the first is things like gold, copper, aluminum, and non-metallic would be gravel, sand, gypsum, phosphate, salt, all those things that we use for construction. Um, if you think about uh, building concrete for our sidewalks, we have to get those materials somehow. So the first is, uh, let's talk about the non-metallic mineral resources. Uh, so if you ever redone your kitchen or um, redid your bathroom, these you might buy a slab or a stone. So this is like an, an intact slab of blocks of rock. Um, you might buy this if you're trying to redo your countertops and you don't want to have multiple slabs or small pieces because then it makes it hard to clean your countertop. So uh, we can buy a whole slab of material. Uh, another one, like I mentioned, is crushed stone or concrete. This is where we have uh, used things in construction like our sidewalks, highways, or roads. And concrete is a slurry of aggregate mixed with water and cement. And so much of this stuff is used today in our infrastructure. Some of the other materials or minerals that we use are things like quartz, which is found in silica used in solar cells, or even gypsum, which is used in drywall. So we talked a little bit about this um, when we went over minerals a long time ago in class, but we have to think about where we get them and how we find them. Okay, so the other source is metals, and these are shiny, smooth, solid that conduct electricity, can be malleable, bent, uh, we use it in wiring, we can be made into sheets, uh, and metals look and behave the way they do because their atoms are being held together by metallic bonds. Some of the first metals were used to include copper, silver, and gold. Ancient metallurgy has been confirmed from 5000 BCE. So metallurgy, the, the practice of melting and smelting and things like that is quite an ancient practice. So here's an example of an ore mineral. This is um, minerals or which metals can be extracted. So uh, like an economic mineral. So not every mineral is considered economic. Um, and ore often contains a high concentration of mineral that, that can be extracted. So here we have some copper. Um, up here, this looks more like uh, some pyrite or something, but um, whatever this is, it's a it's a large quantity of a high concentration of that um, of that metal. Where does it come from? We're going to talk about each of these individually here. So the first is a magmatic deposit. This is when magma intrus uh, when magma intrusion cools, and it starts to solidify. The sulfide ore minerals may crystallize in distinct lenses or bands. An example of this is sulfide deposit. You can see in this picture here on the right that um, this is a, an open pit mine and you can see the sulfide bands and lenses here. It's in that orangish color. We have hydrothermal deposits. This is heat from an intrusion can cause groundwater to start convecting through a pluton or a dike and the wall rocks surrounding the intrusion and when the water heats up and passes through it, it becomes a hydrothermal fluid that can dissolve these metal ions. And then those are carried with um, the fluids and uh, they can be deposited in these hydrothermal vents um, through uh, near a volcano or through, in this case, we have rain 
that is coming down and, and cooling um, the magma around an intrusion and creating these hydrothermal deposits. Okay, next is a secondary enrichment deposit. This is where groundwater passes through ore bearing rock long after the rock has first formed. And then the groundwater dissolves away some of the metal and carries those ions with it. And then eventually, um, as the water carries these ions, they can be deposited and a new metal is formed. So an example of that is a copper bearing carbonate. So this is an example of copper here in this greenish color. Okay, next is a Mississippi Valley type ore. This is a really specific type, but um, what happens is we have rain uh, falling along one margin of a large basin and it sinks into the subsurface and then flow, uh, uh, groundwater flow um, takes it down into the rocks. And at the base of this basin is where we have a heat source or uh, if there's enough pressure below it that it can dissolve these metals. And this is a specific type uh, that's really seen in dolomite beds in the Mississippi Valley region. Okay, sedimentary deposits of metals. Some ore minerals accumulate in sedimentary environments under some of these specific conditions where we have, um, here's an example of banded iron formation, which occurs between 2.5 and 1.8 billion years ago because there's very little oxygen. So this is a regional trend that we see. Uh, the change affected the chemistry of seawater such that large quantities of dissolved iron precipitated as iron oxide. Uh, and the chemistry of the seawater can lead to manganese oxide minerals. So these banded iron formations we can see as a global trend. We also have residual mineral deposits. Uh, this is where rainwater sinks into the earth and can leave behind elements in the soil. Uh, locally, these metals can become so concentrated that the soil itself becomes an ore deposit. Here's an example of where aluminum, which comes from bauxite, um, this is an example of the residual mineral deposit um, through leaching. So this is, uh, this is where we have rainwater that can seep into the, the earth and with it um, create deposits. Okay, next is placer deposits. These are ore deposits. And this is generally when we think about um, mining, most of the mining that we think about in terms of metals come from placer deposits. This is where ore deposits may develop when rocks containing native metals erode. They produce a mixture of sand grains and metal flakes or nuggets that can be concentrated by streams um, because the moving water carries away lighter minerals but can't move the heavy metals. Um, so concentrations of metal grains in stream sediments are a type of placer deposit. And this is where we might see, um, if you've ever watched anything on, um, on whatever TLC about gold panning or gold digging and things like that, you would, you'd be interested in placer deposits because uh, running water can, can carry some of these heavy metals. Um, if you've ever done gold panning, it's a lot of fun. I forgot that I put this picture in here. Um, that's hilarious. So don't make me use my gold panning voice. I don't even know what that means. But if you've ever done gold panning, it's a pretty fun exercise because it's it's quite relaxing. It's maybe akin to, um, you know, doing a puzzle or something. You're there with your little gold pan with your sediments and you dip it in water and you shake it out and you allow the sediments to um, settle and the heavier metals settle out at the bottom of your pan. You can collect those and melt it and, and um, say that you've found gold, you know, going down the river. So I've had experience working in a gold mine. And uh, this is what my office looks like. There's a bunch of rock samples everywhere. And, um, and so what we would have to do is find out where the gold is, where's the gold. And so we would look through some of these rock samples that were collected, we'd crush them up, do a test on them to see what the concentration of gold was on these rock samples. And then we would use modeling software to say, you know, X marks the spot of where uh, the highest concentration of gold was based on these assay data. And then in this um, open pit gold mine, 
what we would do is we would blast the rocks. So uh, we would create zones um, of fractured rock basically that would be moved and sent to either the disposal pile or sent to the crusher. And so um, again, doing that assay data said basically like, you know, X marks the spot or what we would do is use survey flags to say, dig anything over on that side um, and send it to the crusher or dig anything on that side and send it to the disposal because we want to keep uh, the, the rocks that had the most gold in it. Um, so these indicators were used for the, the large trucks that would come in and plow these rocks. So here's, here's a picture of one of those trucks. It's hard to see the scale on here. But if you can imagine that there's a guy sitting in here and driving, these tires are probably at least 10 feet tall. So there's quite a large truck. So these rocks would be then transported to waste piles or leaching piles. And to extract gold from the rocks, they would have to pour a solution of cyanide in water in order to basically leach the metal out of the rocks. And uh, they would be collected in ponds along with all the chemicals and they would be separated and melted and sold and all of that. But uh, this is a, a quick glimpse of, um, of what the, uh, the procedure was for looking for gold in an open pit gold mine. And where I worked is actually, they have their own promotional video. So um, here's a quick run through of some of the facilities of the uh, gold mine in Cripple Creek, Colorado. So check this out. 77 M3, ready and standing by. This is your final warnings for shots going down the pit on the 9445. We'll have the blast iron at this time. <laughs> All units will have a five second countdown before detonation. Five, four, three, two, one. Fire in the hole. My name is Jane Mannon. I am the manager of community affairs for the Cripple Creek and Victor Gold Mining Company. The ore that goes to the crusher, we crush that to about a three quarter inch size. We convey that up to a loadout bin that loads trucks, takes it out onto our Valley Leach facility. We stack the ore on top of that, kind of like putting rocks into a bowl. We sprinkle a dilute sodium cyanide solution on the top of that ore. It dissolves the gold and we also get a little bit of silver that's on the surface of the rock. And it seeks down to the bottom of the lined area. We pump the solution out of the bowl into our processing plant where the gold is filtered out through a series of carbon columns. When that solution comes into the plant, it looks just like water. You really can't see the gold in it at all. strip the gold off the carbon, put that into the refinery with some silica and some other flux agents. The gold and silver are heavier, they sink down to the bottom, and that silica forms a layer of almost like a glass type material on the top. We want to have it so there's nothing that isn't gold and silver, so when we weigh it, we can say, to the refinery, this is how much it weighs, this is gold and so on.
every time I watch that video of um, the Cripple Creek gold mine, it makes me reflect back on how crazy I was as like a 19 year old, as an intern working in a place like that. It's very interesting, um, geologically interesting to think about how gold deposited there, where the gold deposits are, um, and all that, all that stuff. It's it's very interesting, but I also have to uh, remind myself of how crazy it was to work in in such a interesting environment. Okay, so why why is mining important? Um, this this chart is a little bit dated, but here's um, specifically for gold. Um, uses of gold in the United States is broken up here on the left, and this is from 2017. We see that a lot of it is from jewelry, and I imagine now that electronics have exceeded that metric, that we use more gold for electronics. Um, I guess gold is also used in coins and a few other things here. Now, when I was interning at the uh, gold mine here in 2006, this is the price of gold around $600. I really wish I invested some money then because uh, this chart goes until 2019, uh, roughly where gold was around $1,400. Now today it's around $1,800. So it's really come back up in price. And I think that's because we are relying on um, precious metals like gold for electronics. So let's talk about the future of mining. What does that look like? Well, here's a chart of the expected resource lifetime for selected minerals here. So, um, so we see that in 2011, um, this is how much has been produced. This is how much is in reserve and the lifetime of those reserves based on our current consumption. So let's look at, we should, we should be okay with aluminum. We have 132 years left of uh, aluminum. But some of these other numbers, like look at lead, that's quite low. Tin is also low. So when we look at these numbers and what that might mean, what do you think would impact those numbers? How do you think we could change the life of an expected resource? Well, we can try to change uh, manufacturing. Maybe there's an alternative to using aluminum foil or something um, that we would use instead so we can conserve more aluminum. Or maybe that we have some other innovation where some of these metals will last longer than their expected resource. Just something to think about as we consume and consume and consume and we have electronics and we keep building and we keep having more stuff. It's not forever. A lot of these processes that I just showed you with deposits, those take millions of years to occur and we're stumbling upon it and finding a use for them. So it's not like it's a renewable resource in any way. So we have to think about uh, our consumption and how sustainable that is for some of these resources. Okay, so in brief, we talked a little bit more about metals in terms of um, mining, but we talk about the non-metallic uh, resources in the context of minerals. I, I had a video on, um, on granite and um, creating sculptures out of them and things like that. So we use a lot of other uh, resources and, and mining as a way that we can extract those resources. And of course, we have some challenges about sustainability and our use of these resources in the future. See you next time.